But we're going to start with like sort of like a general introduction to what's common to most portfolios. All right. So let's just start <coughs> with what is a portfolio. Okay. So we we narrowed it. We made it into like literally two sentences. We, we started out with what it's not. And a lot of people is a misconception. They think if you could go into Dick Blick or order something online and buy th these portfolio case or the portfolio box that that is your portfolio and you just throw a bunch of prints into it and then you're or, or paintings or whatever um, that's really not what a portfolio is and it's a collection of images for a specific purpose so we're going to take that that starting point there and take it deeper and um, you have to keep in mind that even in the even the end result, you have to look at it that this is your project and these are your works, and you have to be, you have to be happy with this. Okay, you can, you know, you can do all the research in the world and think you have the number one A plus, you know, A plus plus uh, body of work, and it's just not going to serve the purpose for whatever you're trying to use it for, or it may. Okay, so we have to start with the images, and. You know, what, what are some of the commonalities in, in an award? When, you all saw the portfolio reviews, which were wonderful, and, and you all saw it. You all saw that moment of ah, and the, the, the laughter, and the dead silence, and the hmm. You know, you all saw that happening. So um, we're both teachers. We teach in uh, some colleges, and I came from a teaching in a high school background. We've heard every excuse there is to why something can't be what it's supposed to be. The dog, I literally had somebody tell me, my dog ate my print last night. And, <laughs> you know, so it, it's out there. So it doesn't matter. If, if the, there's something wrong technically, and it's obvious, you have to fix it. Deborah was talking to us before about somebody was saying, um, well, you know, it's going to look, it, it, this picture is great, but this is out of blurry, this is blurry because of that, and this is not good because of that. And so she was, her recommendation was, well, you stand here, and if people come to look at the picture, you can tell them everything. It, you can't be. It just has to be there. The presentation is also important. If, you know, he drops on the floor and the corner is nicked, it's yeah. not good anymore. Yeah, it's like, it's like elementary school, you know, neatness counts. Yep, it's got to be, it's got to be flawless in terms of the way it's presented. And the presentation should be, um, relevant to the image. It's not just a matter of um, mats and frames, putting, putting your work in a mat and a frame. Sometimes it doesn't belong in a mat and a frame. Okay? The relevance to the theme. Okay? The aesthetics. The aesthetics are, you know, it's, a, it's subjective. Some people will go in one direction, others will go in another. Uh, and this is why you have to keep to your own, your own aesthetic and, and kind of maintain that throughout and keep it high. Uh, it has to be able to stand on its own. You don't want to have something that needs a big explanation why this is so wonderful, why this is so great. When jurors are looking at work in competitions, um, not so much with galleries or, or, or you know things like that, but with a competition they're looking at sometimes thousands and thousands of images and their people and they zone out. And I've actually watched a judge sit there with a handful of prints and just start going through them like this and then start talking and then look the other way. <laughs> I'm like, oh, come back here. You just went by 15 prints you didn't even look at. And literally spending like less than a second looking at, looking at the work, making that first initial um, uh, edit and, and culling of, of, of the the pile that they have to go through. And it's the same thing if they're looking at things online. Yeah. They're, looking, they're looking at screen after screen after screen of images, and they just, you know, w if it pops out of them, great. If your work is so delicate and so fine that it doesn't even read, you know, it ha you know, really is something that somebody has to sit down, put in your lap, and say, look at this. Or you hang it up on the wall for, and invite people to come, you know, to look at it and read about it with your statement and whatever. That's a different thing. But for a competition, you want to make your presence known as fast as you can and as powerfully as you can. And you want it so that who's ever looking at it wants to stay there and keep looking at your work. You don't want them to move on to the next one because they don't get it. It's, it's boring. It's crooked. It's whatever is wrong with it. Okay, So it has to stand on its own. 
There should be a connection to the viewer. Now again, you, there's what, uh, 85, 100 people in this room? You can't please the whole world. So the number one person you have to please is yourself. And you can't, but you do want to get that kind of universal, universal, universal universality yes. in your work <laughs> where there, you saw it with, uh, with our, you know, portfolio reviews a few weeks ago um, that some of them were just like, it's just, it's done. It's finished. It's beautiful. There's almost nothing to say because, and everybody loves it. Okay, you know the images. Um, cohesiveness in a portfolio is absolutely critical. Um, yeah, one, one bad image in a portfolio of images will make the whole portfolio look bad. Right. So everyone has to be as good as the next. Right. A weak print in a, in a grouping of strong prints <coughs> brings the strong ones down. It doesn't work the other way where the strong ones bring the weak ones up. It, for some reason, it's, it shows up as a flaw. When we look at portfolios at Soho Photo Gallery, it's uh, there are maybe sometimes between 15 and 20 people sitting there <coughs> looking at the work. And we do spend time with the portfolios. They're not um, you know, just quickly ran, run through and then they're out. We spend you know, sometimes 20 minutes looking at a single body of work, discuss, and all 15 people are adding their comments and discussing this. So it's a pretty involved you know, uh, discussion. So the, the, one of the biggest things that we come into is the cohesiveness. And it's, it's almost, why is this print here? Why did this person do these prints that are so wonderful and then have these in here that have nothing to do with it and then have these prints in here that are so weak? That shows up as a flaw that in the photographer, in the artist, that they're not really sure of how to put their work together. So they're just going to show you a little bit of everything. And then you decide. That's the worst thing you want to do when you're putting a portfolio together, is let someone else decide for you what is what you should put out there. OK? Um, and impact. You want to make a strong statement early on in your, in your work. Okay. So I, we went over some of the common mistakes already, but what do you think are some other mistakes that people make when they're doing this? Number one, not following directions. Yeah, Deborah alluded Deborah to it before. That, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it really holds true when you're submitting a portfolio, uh, uh, especially for a uh, juried exhibition, because everyone has a different list of expectations and rules and regulations, and they do this for a reason. It, so it makes life easier for, for them, them. Uh, which makes them looking at your work much nicer. You don't want them to be so frustrated, you know, when they get to your work right. that they don't even want to look at it. Yeah. Um, and with competitions especially, it, you know, again, you're dealing with thousands of people, thousands of images, hundreds of people. And then when the show is selected, then you're dealing with maybe 50. And those 50 people have to send you a statement, send you files, um, Get the, get the work to you. It's got to be pr framed and, and matted properly with wire able to hang. We've gotten things in for shows that you can't <coughs> even hang on the wall. They're little uh, poster things, you know, like little, little strips that go on the edges of the prints that you put up in a, in a, door, a poster up in a dorm room. And it's like, this, this is a frame? You know, th 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 you can't hang it up on the wall. So this is, those are ways that you get like eliminated from, from things. Um, what else do they do with not following directions? Sending it too late, too sending late. the work too late. <laughs> sending it to the wrong address, not including return shipping. Oh, God, the list goes on and on and on. Once you see, uh, yes, you, you, you've experienced this. You're seeing my stall. Yeah, I know. That's twice a year, every year. Yeah, I know. She runs competitions also. It's very, very hard to run a competition and keep the lid on everything when you have when you're trying to juggle 50 people at a time. And one thing you don't want to do when you're part of one of these shows is kind of be the one that rocks the boat. Have the one where 
the, you know, the frame falls apart and breaks on the floor because there's no screws in the frames. Uh, the, 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 the glass is, is scratched and dirty and mm -hmm. there's, there's bugs crawling underneath it. I mean, we, and these are, I'm not making oh, these up. No, this, is real, this is real stuff. <laughs> you know, th this happens. The matting, okay? The, you think, yeah, I want to think of the matting as your um, enclosure. You know, your, your house, the, ho the home for your print. It can't be too <laughs> small or too big. Both are bad. If you had to err on one side or the other, making it too big is better than making it too small. Too small is like trying to put that snowsuit on that just doesn't fit. And you're just trying to squeeze it in there and it doesn't work. Using stock matting that doesn't fit, fit. you may find a great deal at... at um, What's that craft store? Michaels. Michaels, yeah. You might find a great deal on mats, you know, eight by ten inch mats, and then you, you, you go to put your print in there, and you have a seven by nine, and, and the, the proportion is wrong. So or you have seven by ten. Seven by ten, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you have edges that are showing on the print that shouldn't be showing. They literally are just shoved in there just because, you, you know, it says to be matted, and yeah, they're matted. Um, the, the weight of the mat, there's two-ply, four-ply, eight-ply mats, which are the common ones. The two-ply mats are like oak tag, you know, like a, like a heavy file folder. The four-ply mats are probably the most common, and then the, the eight-ply mats are the, those big, beautiful, thick, uh, beveled mats that you know, look beautiful on everything but cost a fortune. So the prices are going to you know, you know, come into this, too. You're going to add something or no? You know, well, it, it's about pricing. Um, you'll find mats that are a decent price, but generally they're, um, it's, they're layers of paper uh, with a nice color layered on top, or the, the, the top color is, is the good paper, and the rest is pretty much cardboard. Cardboard, And yeah. you'll be able to see that in the, in the edge. If the, the edge inside doesn't kind of match the rest of the, the mat, um, it just it looks a little off, depending on the color of your image. But uh, not that we advocate color. Uh, mats at all. No. I think uh, white is, or slight off-white, are the best choices always. Uh, and if you're going to do that, you really should be using museum board, which is 100% uh, uh, cotton rag. It's all one color. It's archival, uh, and it looks beautiful. It's got a beautiful texture to it. So uh, if you, museum rag or museum board, um, a good one is uh, Bainbridge. Um, Rising. Rising is another one. Light Impressions carries them. Light Impressions has them, yeah. Yeah. You can, you can call these companies uh, Archival Methods, uh, Light Impressions. You can look um, up online. You can order yeah. a sample pack, uh, right. like a little sampler, and they'll send you this little packet with all their uh, weights, the weights of the, the boards and the colors of the boards. And then you can see if you need something a little warm for your prints, um, you know, you would go to a warm tone print, if you, uh, warm tone. Uh, mat, or yeah. if you want to just, you know, be safe, you know, a bright white, you, you'll never go wrong with a bright white. Okay. Um, the uh, back to the colors, you want to really stay away from colors. Yeah. It's just, just They're, it's terrible. It, it's. It shouldn't match anything in the room. There are, there are really no My couch words. is green. I'm going to put a green mat <laughs> right. over. No, you don't want to do that. Okay. So yeah. I'm going to just jump ahead for a minute. The, um, for our purposes here, for the, for the portfolio development, for, for you to submit to Soho Photo Gallery, you are not going to have to mat your work or frame it. Okay. If, you, if you're going to submit your work, what you submit will be put up, will, will be, if you're accepted, that will be put up on the walls. I'm going to go over that later. So we're talking a little bit about matting and framing, but for our purposes here for this particular um, project that you're involved in, you won't have to be matting or framing. Okay. Um, the quality of the images or the prints have to be the highest. You can't go <laughs> this, David. You can't go off to Costco and just get you know get a whole <laughs> bunch of prints. I mean, Costco's good if you wanted to. Uh, print out your portfolio for yourself, maybe small little four by fives, so that you can play around with the arranging <coughs> them, and you see what you have, and you can tie, you can live with them for a while without having to go to the expense of doing the big ones yet. But when it's time to do the big prints, um, or it's time for you to put a portfolio together, you can't show uh, what's called a work print. 
And a work print could be anything that was printed on uh, anything from Xerox paper to um, you know, an inexpensive uh, you know, Costco paper. You know, or the or the, the Staples brand yeah, the Staples paper. Brand, yeah. You know, you want to that that you want to stay with. There is a big difference, and you can try this yourself. How many of you have your own printers and you print? Yeah, but it's inkjet. Yes. A high quality one. But an yeah. inkjet is is, inkjet is, is, is the way to go. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 what you want. Okay, um, so you want an inkjet with pigment inks. So some companies will sell um, sampler packages. And you can get, I know, I think Hannah Mule sells one, that you yeah. can, it's for about $20, and you get two sheets of, like, you know, five different papers. And you can print the same print on each paper, and you see the difference, how they come out. Try printing something on, uh, on a crummy piece of uh, Xerox paper with, an, with a laser printer, and then try printing it on a really good inkjet, you know, uh, paper, and you'll, you'll see it's that it's night, it's and, night day. and day. You know, so there's where you want to separate the, 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 the you know, just the, per, the, the, the stuff that you would normally print and throw in the drawer and just keep there for, for a record to the ones that you're going to put into a case and keep as a portfolio and, you know, sh and exhibit. We're going to come back to questions about that later. Hmm? It was pr uh, printer profiles. Yeah, we're, we're gonna, okay. that, that's really nothing that we're going to. That, that, that's in a printer class. Okay. Um, the framing for if you do get into a show, we said this before, it's got to be a good quality frame. Please stay away and, from the and dollar store. Right. And, and keep it simple. Yeah. Very simple. Yeah. No, you know, no curvy wood, no decorative frames, just uh, a simple, simple, either metal or wood. Black usually works. Um, Black or charcoal gray or something yeah. like that, but, or silver, you know, but Go, again, you'd have to go by what the requirements are. And watermarks, we, talked, we touched about this in the portfolio reviews. Keep your name off of the file. Um, it's not fair to a judge to have to look at the work. They're supposed to be judging work blindly without knowing who's who. Um, we just had a, a case recently where someone asked, do you think it would be OK? I know the judge. The judge just saw all my work. And I'm going to submit this work for a competition. Do you think it's, you think it'll keep, it'll be bad for me to do that? And I said it's not bad for you. It's bad for the judge. Why are you going to put that judge in that position? You know, you should be you should be putting in work that you know this person doesn't know, or not entering into that competition. It's it's kind of an awkward situation to be to be placed in on both sides. You know, do you want to win something because you know the judge? Do you want to get into the show because you know somebody? Or do you want to get in because your work is so wonderful? and it belongs in that show. Those are the questions that you have to ask yourself. So keep your name off. You can embed your information in uh, Photoshop, in their file um, menu info. Mm -hmm. You can put all sorts of stuff in there, name, address, telephone numbers, a t a copyright, all sorts of goodies. Yeah. Um, you want to tell the story about the... Uh, and that stays with the file. It stays it's, with the file, but it doesn't sees it show until up until they go find that information. As a matter of fact, the gallery owner uh, was telling us a story about how people always come in uh, and ask if they're looking. You know, are they looking at new work? And they say no. He said, but sometimes people will leave a CD and they look at it and say, sorry, this is not for us. But he said occasionally, um, maybe the body of work didn't work for us. But once a year, I do a landscape <coughs> show and. If I think, oh, this is a really interesting landscape, maybe I'll hold on to this CD, and when it's time for that show, I'll contact. So he goes into the file, and he goes to contact the person. There's no contact information. So if you put your contact information into the metadata in your file when you're bringing it into Photoshop or Lightroom, um, that information is always there with the file. Your name, you can put your address in there, or at the very least, your, your email address, some way for this person to contact you. Right. And, and it's always there. So it, in case of copyright infringement or whatever, the, your information is in that file. Right. There was just a case of a, while, a little while ago with uh, Shepard Fraley, a, um, a graphic designer who uh, really started to, to make it pretty big. And he uses photography. And he was just taking images from, you know, from the internet and then making these beautiful silk screens. And he did a very famous one of uh, President Obama. And uh, so it was getting a lot of, you know, a lot of play and a lot of look. And actually, the photographer that took that picture recognized it as his picture and mm -hmm. was able to prove that it was his picture from the metadata that's in his file. So protect yourself, but 
don't put your name on your prints. And when yeah. you're showing your work, never put your work on your on your photograph. Don't don't no. don't do that. Keep that off. Yeah. Okay? So you if you're going to be posting to Facebook or or Twitter yeah. or something, you want you know you want your watermark in there, faint you know faint watermark. That's fine, but not not in a print that that someone is going to be looking at. It's first of all, it's distracting, and it just. Um, right. I would actually say for Facebook and for Instagram and all that stuff and Twitter. I would put my, I would yeah. put it on there. Yeah. You know, small on the bottom. At least it's there, and there's no, people can see it. And they, they you know, if they take it, then they're going to have to deal with getting your date off of it. You know, and, <laughs> and your name. <laughs> the other big mistake that people make is believing that the place is more important than the image. You know, I've been to a exotic land. I've been to Egypt, and these are my pictures from Egypt. And look at how wonderful they are. And basically, all they are is your travel pictures. It's a memory of, for you to remember where you've been. It's not the stuff that is going to, um, you know, that we talked earlier about, the voice, uh, or the, sl the one I love is the canyons that out west. The yeah, the slot canyons. Slot canyons. Everybody that goes there comes back with the same set of pictures, and then you've seen one, you've seen them all. You know, it's just that there's not, you know, it's not that interesting to look at as, as a photographer looking at them and less so for a gallerist or, or a judge to look at them because they've seen them. So if you're a travel <laughs> photographer, and a lot of you were, we, we, you know, we saw that from when you came and you brought your work in, that's wonderful. But you got to go deeper than that. Mm -hmm. it's, not the, it's not where you are or what you're shooting, it's how you're shooting it. Remember, you just, gotta, you just can't make that more important than, than the, the photograph. Yeah, there are people that never leave their house yeah. and make great images. Yeah. You know, it's just a matter of how you see things. Okay. What's next here? So, knowing what we just, or just keeping all that information in mind, what makes a strong portfolio we have here? So, your imagery has to be top notch. Your, your, the pictures, the cohesiveness has to be in there. Your intention. What are you doing this for? We all hit on this. The voice of the artist. And then your statement. Now, this, some places require a statement, some pl places don't. Uh, if they don't ask for a statement, I wouldn't include one. If they do ask for a statement, I would definitely include one and not, yeah. not just say, well, but I don't have anything. Yeah. You, know, you stick for a while it, and do it. But keep it short. <laughs> About a paragraph. Yeah, they don't want to see pages of you know, your life history and why you photograph and, and eventually get to this portfolio just <coughs> strictly about the work that they're seeing. Right. This body of work represents blah, 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 and, you know, or, or something like that. So it's not like you know, I was born in, you know, <laughs> I was born in the 50s. And, <laughs> and you go on from there. You know, they don't want a bio. They, you know, if they ask later on for about, a, you know, a biographical, you know, a backdrop for you because it's for a show or something like that. Again, another paragraph and, and that's it. <laughs> okay, so you're editing. This is the most difficult thing for a photographer and or any mm -hmm. artist to do. Um, you need a critical eye, which means you have to be very, very honest with yourself and look at something and, you know, almost maybe from a, on a, on a it a negative eye that you want to look for things that are wrong with something and and if it's not really you can't make a good case for it to be there then it should go the other thing is no I was gonna say something about editing and how um, you know how difficult it is and most people think well I can't edit I don't know how to do that you know I'll, I'll ask somebody else to do it for me but you edit every time you take a photograph you edit you you decide what goes in the frame what doesn't go in the frame where you're gonna stand how, how big something is or how small something is. So you're editing every single image you make. Right. That's the first edit you start with. So as discerning as you are when you take that first picture, that's how discerning you have to be when you're editing your whole portfolio. What works, what doesn't work. Look at them all together. Does this just not quite make it? If you're not sure, get rid of it. So Lois, how many pictures do you think you should have? <laughs> If you want, if you know you need to put a portfolio together that has 12 to 20 pieces in it, about how many images should you have shot? I don't know, maybe four or five hundred. At least. <laughs> Minimum. <laughs> oh, I'm not kidding. <laughs> but, and that's always how it is with putting together a body of work. You, you shoot, 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 and generally I don't find my stride in shooting until I'm into it for, you know, because I, 
I'm like one of those, um, you know, like I, I have a project and I start shooting it and then I don't stop until I feel like it's done. So until like maybe a week or two into it, then I feel like, okay, now I've kind of figured out what I'm doing. So, you know, just, just shoot and things will appear. The, the, it, it unrolls for you. It, it will unravel. It, it will actually take on a life of its own where the, the, you, you'll get to pieces where it will start to just dictate to you what you should be doing. Now I have to go do this. Now I have to go do that. Because of, you know, the, the, the 500 images that are behind you. And you'll never get there unless you have that behind you. So, you know, we're just throwing numbers out here. It, it could be, you know, 10,000 pictures. It could be 20, you know, before it, it, something kicks in where it's going to drive you, uh, you know, on your way. The other thing is you want to make sure that you, you don't lose your passion for photography and just only think of, well, I'm doing this for this, you know, for a portfolio. You know, you just want to shoot and you just want to make beautiful pictures. The beautiful pictures will yield more beautiful pictures. And we tell this to our students, too. It's a really wonderful thing about photography is that the more you shoot, the better you'll get and the better your pictures will become. It'll, it'll just happen. You won't have to you know, force it. And like anything else, like an athlete, or if you sit back for six months and don't do anything, you'll get rusty. Your eye will go flat. You'll, you'll, you know, you'll have to start all over again. So keep it going. Even if you set yourself a, um, uh, you know, a challenge that every day, you, anybody, did anybody do that five-day black and white challenge? Yeah. Yeah, that was really cool. And you can still do it. All you do is just post a black and white picture up yeah. there, and you, and you just say, you know, Sandy and Lois challenged us to do this uh, black and white challenge. Put it on Facebook, put it on Twitter, put it on Instagram, put it out anywhere, and then challenge one of your friends to do it too. So, and this is, you know, it's, it's kind of a really cool thing. Hi, David. Here's David in the back. Hi. Okay, <laughs> so the other thing about editing and a critical eye is to get yourself a good friend. <laughs> Okay, and uh, someone that you can trust who's going to be honest with you and tell you exactly what's wrong or what's right or what needs to be in there um, with your work. Okay, um, we do it all the time when we sit down and we look at each other's work. If I'm showing, she comes and she looks at my work. If she's showing, she brings us stuff. We, we, we get together and we, we go through them. And, and uh, you know, I have no problem telling her like something really sucks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and and usually when I look at it again, she's right. You know, you, you get very emotionally invested in all of your images. I, you know, they're like your children, right? And you don't want to like get rid of one, but sometimes, sometimes you if, have to. If the kid is bad, you got to go. you got to kick him out. <laughs> <laughs> you got to get rid of it. Exactly. So <laughs> on the analogy, on the other side. But, you know. <laughs> one friend is good. One one fellow photographer who understands, or it doesn't have to be a photographer. You, you may be, you know, friends with a sculptor or a painter or something like that. Just somebody who has, a, you know, who is in uh, dealing with visual arts, or an, or an artist. Maybe a mus musician would be able to, to help you. You know, just as long mm -hmm. as it's somebody who's into an art, into the arts. You want to make sure that you don't ask too many people. If you ask ten people their opinion, <laughs> you're going to get ten different opinions, and you can only do one. So you're going to annoy nine people. <laughs> and then you can never go back to them again for anything else because you've kind of shut that door behind you. I'm not wasting my time. It's a lot. It's hard yeah. to do. We did a workshop yesterday, and we had prints, actual prints that we laid out on the table. There were only six people. And they came, and they had to edit this, know, 12, this 15 or 16 prints. They had to edit it down to 12 prints, and then they had to put them in order. There wasn't two people that agreed with anything. Right. Everyone was different. They, I said, take a print that you think doesn't belong there and turn it over. Well, everybody grabbed a print and turned it over. And then the next person came along and turned it back. No, this must be there. No, it doesn't. And it was the, the, argue, the, the, the conversation, the dialogue that happened was, was really, really interesting that yeah. of, of the comments that they came up with to why it should be there and why it should not be there. And they were all right, but there you go. There were six different people with six different opinions. So you have to you have to kind of go with your heart on there and make sure that you're you know you're listening to the person who you're you're asking because you trust them. Um, the venue is also very very important. If you, you if your work if you know where your work is going to go, you should prepare it for that venue. You want to make sure that if there's a lot of little nooks and crannies in the place 
and you, you can separate your work and you have like a wall to, you know, like you don't have like a one, one big wall uh, that would, everything's going to be hung in a row. You know, you can have a little bit of a different approach to it than if you do have to have something where everything is going to be just, you know, down the wall. So if you've never been to Soho Photo Gallery, you should come and take yeah. a look and see what the walls are like and see, you know, the color of the walls are, are like a, an 18% gray. Um, you know, just keeping that in mind when you start to put your work together for this, for this project, okay? Themes, we touched on this before. You want to make sure it's appropriate. If you do, you know, um, lingerie work and, and the, the, the venue is going to be um, in a church, in a church <laughs> or a children's <laughs> library, that might not be appropriate. So you want to make sure that your theme that you're doing for this particular project kind of matches where your where your venue is. It all ties in together there. Um, should you show work that's recent? Some of you have been photographers for a very long time, or should you go back and show your your work that you did 30 years ago? What do you think the answer to that is? Recent. Who recent. says recent? Raise your hands. Who says vintage? I think both. Who doesn't know? I think it's a matter of taste. Well, if you, if you, if you um, are new to photography and you're, um, I mean, if you're Dwayne Michaels or if you're uh, trying right. to think of somebody else. If, you've had, if you have an exhibition record. If you have a record, <laughs> yeah. Then you want to do some kind of a retrospective where, where you show stuff that you did early on, maybe in, in conjunction with what you're doing now. Something, again, however you put the spin on it. Um, that may work. But to go cold into something and bring work in that's 30 years old, it tells the people who's looking at the work that this person might not have been taking any pictures at all for the last 30 years, and this is all they have. Um, and which brings us to um, Fluffy the dog. Uh, we talked about this a little <laughs> bit during the portfolio review. If it's a picture of your, your baby, your dog, your cat, your, your husband, your wife, or whatever, your mother, your grandmother, Lolly, whatever, Whoever it is, it, it doesn't <laughs> matter if it, that be just because they're in the picture. The, if the picture stinks and doesn't belong with the rest of the stuff, you have to take it out. By the way, it doesn't <coughs> have to be a person. It could just be your favorite picture, a, a landscape. This is, this, is, you know, this is what I think is the best landscape I've ever taken. But if it doesn't go with the rest of the work that you're trying to show, then that, that Fluffy the dog has to come out and maybe go somewhere else. Okay. Sequencing. So once again, the venue, how you put your work together is really, really important. Uh, when we look at work in, um, in Soho, some people will put numbers on the back of their work, which is a really smart thing to do, because you don't know who's going to unpack the work and how they're going to put it out. Sometimes it, some per the person is standing on the, on the right side just puts them all out in order, however they come out of the box, and they're going backwards. Or Two people are putting it out and say, here, you take this stack, I'll Shoot. take this stack, and we put them out, and they could be completely out of order. <coughs> All right? And what happens a lot when we're doing things is with 15 people there, <coughs> someone will come up and go this, and they'll change, they'll, they'll change it around. Or they'll move something from the f one mm -hmm. side and put it on the other side. Or they'll pair up a couple. Or they'll take some out. That's editing. Okay? <coughs> Which... All of a sudden, it starts to come up, why are we doing this? Why are we editing this person's work? It's a flag. OK? Yeah. So, you can, so what we do is we sit down with those people and we show them. We took your portfolio. You didn't have an order. You didn't have it. You know, th there was no rhyme or reason to this. They were just in the box. We feel that they're stronger like this. What do you think? And if, you know, sometimes the person says, you know, go to hell. Sometimes they, they're very you know, thankful. Go, oh, I didn't even see that. Also, it's important to live with the work for a while. You don't, mm -hmm. you don't rush out and put together a portfolio and then submit it somewhere. You have to live with the images. You have to look at them. I suggest, and what I do is I make small, I make a, a, a printout, you know, a big sheet of paper, I make small pieces if I've got 20 images, say, and I'll, and I'll just the way I would print them, the, the color, everything is just is correct. And then I cut them out, and then I line them up on a table with nothing else on it, and I look at them, and I move them around, 
I see how this image works with that one, so I'll move them. And I, I'll do this, you know, for a week or more before I decide. And then sometimes after looking at them, you know, sometimes it takes a couple of weeks. You keep looking at them and then you decide, you know what, this one really isn't, I don't know where to put this one. Take it out and all of a sudden it looks better. It comes together. You yeah. know, so Sequencing it's, is very, very important. You really, you have to, you have to live with it to know, you'll eventually get to the point where you can look at it um, with less, you know, intensity or less, uh, mm. what's the word I'm looking for? So, like, Emotion. Yes, thank you. Um, <laughs> you get emotion. used to it. Yeah, you get, you get yeah. used to it. Yeah. They become less precious. Exactly, they do. Yeah. They become art rather than your pictures. Your babies. You yeah, they're, they're, they're not. They're not. If you lost everything tomorrow, you haven't lost a thing. So, you start again. Um, transitional pieces. Sometimes you need to go from to get from A to Z. You need, you know, M in the middle, and that's the one that kind of makes it flow. So you, you, sometimes you need it, sometimes you don't. You want to think about that. Um, signature pieces. So again, going back to the venue, if the venue has a place where you can maybe highlight the one piece that's the signature piece, maybe that one is printed larger than the rest of them. Maybe that one is is. Um, um, could yeah. be placed in the middle. Could be placed in the know, middle with things it, it, coming. You, you want to, you know, maybe draw attention to it without having it like overpower things. But your signature piece is stuff that you would use maybe on your invitation, the card, uh, on your publicity, your press that you would send out. You'd put that out on Facebook. I'm having a show. Here's my, you know, you wouldn't put them. You wouldn't. You don't throw all your pictures out there. Just show them one, and this is the this is the one that you're gonna, you know, you think is the the strongest in the show. Um, framing, matting, and alternative presentations. Uh, again, you want the framing and the matting to be appropriate for the imagery, okay? The, the standard is a frame and a mat. However, you go down to Chelsea now and you start looking at some of the things on the wall. Maybe they're in a frame without a mat. Maybe they're in, the fr they're in a frame without glass. Maybe there is no frame and they're hanging on the wall with push pins or magnets or they're printed on um, uh, plastic and they're, they're, they're floating on the wall. There's lots of different ways to present work these days. So you have to keep that in mind uh, when you're making your work. How is this going to be, where am I going to go with this? Do I want it just in this box, in this portfolio box that I will, I'll eventually turn into a book? Do I want it up on the wall in my, li my living room and that's as far as it's going to go? Um, Am I going to look for a show in a certain gallery and, and then I can eliminate my mat or whatever? Don't, don't eliminate the mat in the frame just because it's cheaper. It's, it's not. It usually isn't because the other techniques could, could cost you more. If you're doing some kind of fancy print, I know the printing on the acrylic is very it's expensive. It's a fortune. Yeah. yeah. Very expensive. Or on, mat, on metal, you know, they do those yeah. huge metal things. Yeah. It costs a fortune and they're yeah. just. It's not, it's not an alternative. To, it, it is an alternative to mass and frames, but sometimes it's not appropriate. So you have to make sure that it works with your imagery. Um, you want to be consistent with your work and not repetitive. We've seen actual portfolios come in of, let's say, an example of a street photographer. And photographing you know, have, has the right amount, has the 12 pictures. They're all presented properly. They're all printed beautifully. But they were all shot within like one hour. And you see everybody in the pictures are wearing the same clothing. You see it's the same day, the same climate, the same, light, same yeah. light, same everything. And you know that this person really just went out just to make these 12 pictures, just to bring it in for a portfolio review. So don't waste your time with that. It, it, it has to develop over a period of time. Printing. So your printer and your monitor have to be uh, uh, calibrated. calibrated. Um, how many have had problems where you, uh, those of you that print with an inkjet printer, it looks great on your screen, you go to print it out and it's dark? Yeah, dark or green. Or green or, or, or something, <laughs> okay. A lot of that comes from the calibration of your monitor. So I think the, the workshop that they had right before us was a, a, I one. a I1 or something like one of, it was a monitor, it was a calibration, color calibration class. I mean, that's a good thing to, to, to kind of know. Um, even after I calibrated everything, 
and spent a ton of money on a beautiful Epson printer and an iMac <laughs> um, computer and a new Canon camera and oh, treated myself really good one year. Everything, every I would have to make ten prints to get to get it to, to to get it to to get it to match to get it to look the way I wanted it to look. And when I got it to look the way I wanted it to look on the print, it looked god awful on the screen. So, you know that it's it's a that's a hell, you know, print, printer's hell. So to my solution to that was I went to a RIP system. Your paper selection is going to be important. Um, you, you want to make sure that you have uh, something, again, that's going to, to work well. If you're not sure, I would stick with a, a luster type of paper. It's going to be very, it's going to be the most forgiving. Uh, matte papers are sometimes difficult. You know, but you can use certainly use them, and glossy papers are fine too. But I think the luster papers are the ones that would give you a you know a yeah, most consistent a depth result to them. I think. Yeah, you want the prints to be consistent. You don't want one to be on the green side, one on the blue side. You know, again, watch that. And if you don't have a printer, it doesn't matter. You still have to know all this <laughs> because you have to be able to communicate with the person who is making the prints for you. Uh, Maplethorpe never went in a dark room. Never developed a roll of film, never did anything like that. He hired people to do all that. But he knew how to speak to those people, and he knew exactly how he wanted it to, to look. So that's what you have to do. Um, just one second. Um, you have to be able to get your vision across to your printer. Now, that doesn't mean that you say, here's my files, you know, you know my vision, make it look great. You know, you don't want to do that. You don't want to ever hand over the, 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 the power to somebody else. Uh, so you need to be able to, you know, fix, make your file so that it will print properly. So you need to, you know, educate yourself with, you know, how how the whole thing works, so that you can you can get your output to 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 match your vision, and learn how to prepare your files for the output that you want. Okay. Um, here's some just some general tips for good photography. Uh, you should shoot every day. Um, some people like this, some people don't. To journal your thoughts, get a, like, like an idea list together. Uh, there's all sorts of good apps that you can do for that where you can just keep, keep a record of everything. Or you can just write it down. Experiment without the option of exhibiting. So just make prints for the, for, or make, make, and making prints is important. Yeah. So don't n wait to make a print until <coughs> you're ready to have a show. Just, even if you're making inexpensive prints just for yourself and you are going off to Costco or CVS or something like that, just so you have the image in front of you. You know the drawer everybody used to have at home with all the pictures in it that we don't have anymore because they're all like trapped inside our computers and we don't even know what they are? OK, make, make something. Put, put a little something together. and, and mm -hmm. tack, even if you tack them on the wall. Yeah, tack them on the wall. Just look at them. Yep. Um, uh, visit museums and galleries. Stay current. You're going to see things that you like, and you're going to see things that you hate. Sometimes it's good to see things that you hate so you know what not to do, that, or know that we, what you will never do. So Chelsea's full of that, so that's, that's fun. You want to read. Make sure you're up on what's going on. Uh, we talked about getting a friend to help you edit. This is a really good one. Volunteer to do something for free. Be a mentor or start a group. Uh, teach what you need to learn. If you know you want to learn how to use Lightroom, get Lightroom. Get yourself a one-month subscription to lynda.com. Watch everything. Um, you do all the tutorials, and then sit down with a friend and say, I'm going to teach you how to do this. OK? <laughs> you will learn more by teaching that person who's going to, be, who's going to get nothing out of it. You'll get more out of it by, by being able to communicate to them, this is how it works. This is how you have to do it. And it doesn't have to be Lightroom. It could be just how to use your camera or how to do a you know, an HDR or, or whatever. You pick, pick whatever it is that you want to learn how to do and teach it to someone else. Practice non-attachment. Your work is not holy, OK? It really isn't. Like I said, if you had a fire in your house and you lost every picture you ever took for, the, for your entire you know, existence on this planet, if you still can do this, you can continue and do more pictures. You, you can still continue and make beautiful pictures, probably better. You won't be bogged down with any of that stuff. And I know because I did have a fire and lost everything. And it's just, it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me.
<laughs> no, I that's, didn't say that's, that that's then. It. Yeah. No. But, <laughs> but now when I look at it, it's yeah, a lot we're not cleaner. Advocating that, a lot just to be don't <laughs> just to be clear. Yeah. <laughs> um, invest in yourself. You know, don't cheap out. You know, you, you know, if, you, if you're doing something, you know, if you have to, you know, sacrifice that extra dinner somewhere in a fancy place to, to buy that whatever, do it. You know, but make sure that you're, you're doing it for the right reasons. Um, and you're responsible for everything in the frame. I know David, David said this a lot when we do the portfolio reviews. You can shoot less but be more careful. Just really watch what's in there. Get your eye up and into that eye eyepiece and, and really, really there, like Lois said, that's your first step into editing. So, you know, am I going to include this or not? And be a lifelong learner. You all are because you're all here. You know, you want to practice your craft, you want to do it every day um, and, and make it a part of your life, not just something you do for, well, I hope I become rich and famous someday because you won't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and if you do, remember us. Yes. <laughs> Okay, we have, uh, we're going to give this to you. We have, uh, we have a list of resources for you. Um, the one on the bottom, lensculture.com, is a really good one. If you go there, uh, you can um, download a book. Uh, what is it, about a 30, 40 page book? And mm -hmm. they, what they, did, they run competitions. They're an online competition sponsor. And what they did was they contacted a whole bunch of jurors, and they had the jurors write down a sort of little statement about what they look for when they're judging work, yeah. which is really important to know. Uh, and, and it's the stuff that we talked about today, but there's some other little gems in there, too. We're going to do very quickly with you uh, a little editing exercise. This is what we did to the people yesterday. We threw these prints out on the table, and they had to take them out and put them in. Um, so here are 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16 pictures that have to be edited down to 12. Okay? Nope, they're not in order. It is one project. It is one body of work. Um, it's, uh, it, it's called the In Project. It's about, you know, fashion industry dictating to us what's, what's, uh, what we should be looking like and wearing. Um, they're all windows. Okay. So let's just start on the top row. Which ones do you think should? We have to lose four of them. So we got it down to this 12 in that order. And the reasons, we started with the two, the, the beginning and the end, almost like a flow, OK? We had the positioning of, the, of some of the frames where they were facing each other or they were angled in towards each other. Um, some were straight on, some were looking left, some were looking right. So that's all part of the consideration. Color palette, we started off on a, uh, you know, the purpley, pinky thing coming into a more neutral, um, you know, golden color into the whites heading more towards bridal uh, and, and, you know, spring springtime dresses. Um, and that's basically, you know, this is what we came up with. Okay, so you see, <laughs> you, can, you can make a lot of things work with a lot of different, you know, you know, rules that you kind of like make for yourself. If you can, you need to justify sometimes what, what you're doing. I mean, and this can change again. Like I said, six people yesterday had six different answers and they were all right and they were all different. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, B&H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.